Hello everyone, welcome to the special CUBE conversation here in theCUBE's Palo Alto studio. I'm John Furrier for a conversation around venture capital, entrepreneurship, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and more. Jonathan Ebener, friend with BRV, uh, formerly Blue Run Ventures, but BRV for short, sounds better. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks John, Conversation. Thanks for having me. Great to, to see you, we've known each other for a long time, and um, you know, you've been a great investor. Your firm has done a lot of great stuff. Um, deals are, are uh, really famous deals. But also you dig into the companies and you really stand by your portfolio companies. But you've also done a lot of work in China. Yes. Uh, so you have a good, good landscape of what's going on. What's, the, what's going on in China? Well, China is really expanding in ways which we had not foreseen when we first started investing in there almost 15 years ago. We were really active for five to five to ten years, investing in companies that initially were being considered copycat companies. You can't really use that term anymore. There, in fact, what's happening more and more, you're seeing Chinese ideas coming to the United States. Businesses like WeChat are being copied as fast as they can. You're seeing Snapchat, Messenger, and so forth. They're quickly trying to amalgamate as many assets as they can within their viewership, much like we're seeing in a lot of the, of the Chinese uh, 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 analogs over there. So it's, it's exciting to see, really, it's very much of an arms race. And it's been interesting to watch. We were at the uh, Alibaba Cloud Conference um, last year, and then the last year. It's interesting, the innovation and entrepreneurial thirst has really changed. If you go back just 10 years ago, when you, were, you guys were first getting in there, I remember the conversations were, you know, what's going on in China? It's very developmental, but what is, what's going on in 10 years is that they are dominating the mobile space. Their mobile usage is really much different makeup and how they do startups, the apps. How much of that has influenced uh, some of their success, just the demand? Well, always on, location always available. It opens up a whole new level of communication services. The idea of the larger screen format, people used to think in the United States, these large uh, devices coming out of Korea first and then China, we thought they would never play in the United States. Now Apple 10, it, larger screen size, it makes sense. It's mobile first right from the get-go for, for, for now a billion plus users. Okay, so BRV, how many active portfolio companies do you guys have and what's the profile uh, that you're looking for for entrepreneurs? What's the, what are some of the kind of companies you Sure. Well, we're about 45 active companies right now. We're putting, about, uh, we're putting money into about 10 new companies a year at this point. We have a very disciplined approach of investing in Series A style companies. Series A, of course, means a lot of different things to people, but generally we like to put three to five million dollars to work early on and then follow on. And how much you take for that? Just like the, the typical 35%? You know, typ typical in the 20, 25% range, right? So there's a lot of companies out there that still fit that profile. Of course, yeah. you're seeing some supersized Series A's that happen. Yeah. We don't play in those, but for the traditional mm -hmm. software companies, uh, valuations are really right in our sweet spot. And how big is the fund now? Just what's the number in terms of? Are we oh, we're in funds. We're in fund six. We're just over over 150 million. Yeah. And you got to save some for follow-on rounds. Exactly. Talk about the changes in venture capital because what's interesting. I had a conversation with Greg Sands with Costa Noah Ventures, another mm -hmm. great investor, formerly the first. I think the first uh, employee at Netscape. I think he wrote the business plan. Great guy. He talked about the dynamics of you don't need that much cash anymore because if you can get unit economic visibility into what the, the business is working, you can do so much more with that. And I'm calling it the hourglass effect. You get through yeah. that, that visibility, you're in control of your own destiny versus the old Silicon Valley model which seems to be fading away which is, hey, 40, you need $40 million. Right, or here's right. $100 million. That really limits your e exit options. And sometimes you can drown Right, in right. your own capital. Talk about that dynamic. Yeah, well you're seeing the $40 million rounds with businesses that are much more capital intensive, and that's coming back in vogue now, but for the most part I agree with what Greg's saying, and this whole advent of these seed funds and super seed funds and angel funds and so forth has been really great for the traditional Series A investor. A lot of that early fundamental and foundational work is being done, and then when the Series A comes, it's really more about expansion. So we're effectively getting what was a Series B type stage company, now we're investing in Series A. So we're saying, hey, this product works, there's product market fit, let's put dollars to work to really grow the market. So you're saying the Series B uh, was a proven, prove it, you kind of proved the business model, yes. shifted down to the A because the cost to get there is lower, and hence that's opened up a seed round lower number, so it just shifts down a little bit. It really bit. has, it really has. And that's really plays into our, into our sweet spot. We really like working on business models, distribution strategies, things like that. And what kind of um, startups do you want to invest in? What are some of the categories? We love financial services, we like health tech, we're, in, we're doing education. We're really pretty omnivorous when it comes to the sector. 
what we're looking for is really businesses that are using data, real-time data to disrupt an So industry. you're not sector-driven, you're disruption-oriented. That's right. Okay, so talk about, let's talk about disruption, my favorite trend. Obviously, I love the China dynamic, because it's, uh, you know, you're not sure what it is, but it's really doing well, <laughs> so you can't ignore it, but it's, you know, and, and they're innovative and they're hustling hard, and they got massive numbers. But yes. blockchain, we're super excited about. We love crypto, we think it's the, the biggest wave uh, coming out there, so, you know, a lot of the, my smart entrepreneurial friends are jumping on their surfboards, literally, and jumping out on those waves, and there's a lot of action there. At the same time, people are saying, stay away from that whole you know, crypto thing, it's a scam. So you kind of a different perspective. What's your thoughts yeah. on that? Well, if you look at, you separate the cryptocurrencies from blockchain, I think it comes a lot more clear. Blockchain is for real. Tracking provenance on transactions, real, transa real estate transactions, multinational transactions, makes a lot of sense. It dovetails nicely with security, so there's a real business there. You saw the announcement with you know, IBM and Maersk the other day, where they are taking enterprise level blockchain into their whole supply mm -hmm. chain. I think that's really important. We have a company in the category called Paystant, which is doing the same sort of thing with smaller size businesses, mm -hmm. just accelerating the whole process on the accounts receivable, taking working capital. Uh, and they're doing blockchain for that. Uh, yes, blockchain is an option for it. We're not, we don't, we're not forcing people onto yeah, yeah. blockchain, but. The idea is, hey, let's give people more cost-effective ways to, trans to transact, get rid of the paper checks, get rid of the invoicing, and just join the modern world. Much like you use Venmo for, if you and I are going to exchange money. That's Paystand. Yeah. That's one of your hot companies. Yeah, it is, absolutely. So they are, um, are they using blockchain or not? You're they not are. Sure. Oh, yes. they are, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a physical asset. It's kind of a supply chain thing, or well, they use it to track the 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 funds themselves. Unlike a credit card, where you have to pay a big fee, or ACH, which you can't really get proof of funds with with their blockchain te technology. You can be sure that you have the funds available and you get it instantly. Awesome. Well, let's talk about um, use cases that you think out there. I'd like you to just weigh in on um, use cases for blockchain that a mainstream person that's not in the tech business would understand. Because when they say, ah, is it real or not? I agree, blockchain is the legit. What are some use cases that would highlight that? Well, I think if you've ever uh, been involved in real estate, bought a home, things like that, look, uh, just tracking title insurance. You're going all the way back here, if you live in California, you go all the way back to you know, pre-statehood pre, uh, pre statehood days. You want to have to track the provenance of that land all the way through. You're paying title insurance. Title insurance is a business you don't really need if you have accurate provenance tracking through blockchain. I think that's one we can, most of us can understand. Um, obviously, bills of, bills of lading with th things coming over on ships, it's natural. I mean, right now things get held up in port because you, people are trying to find a clipboard before you can sign off on who is this bill of lading actually clean. That stuff can all be done automatically with 2D barcodes. Yeah, Blockchain uses all that. Certainly if it's perishable goods too, we sure. heard that with IBM's example. Okay, let's get into some of the hot companies you got going on. Name some of the hot investments that you've done. Sure, well I talked about Pace 10 a minute ago, we're really excited about them. Another one we really like is a company called Aerobotics. I know you're a fan of autonomous flying. What, if you think about drones, and everyone knows DJI and they're a great company, that's one to one, one person flying one drone. That's not scalable, obviously, yeah. it scales at one to one. With autonomous flying, you can have a whole army of drones out doing your business, whether they're you know, doing site exploration, checking for chemical spills, looking at traffic and so forth. The company is now operating in, in three continents. It's just a, a if you think about what a drone is, it's effectively, it's a flying cell phone. It's a cell phone that goes around, takes pictures, transmits yeah. data back. We know something about cell phones at, at BRV. We've been investing in this category for a long time. So when we saw yeah. aerobotics come along, we had, this is just a natural extension of real-time data, cellular technology, real, and, um, and location-based services. You guys do, don't get a lot of credit and as much as you should, in my opinion, on that. You guys were very early on the mobile, and mobile you know, connectivity side, and mobile footprint, and device, and software. That's playing well into the, the hottest trend that we see, that's not the sexiest trend, that's IOT. Absolutely. This is, drones are certainly industrial IOT is a big one. For sure. You know, instrumenting, physical plant, equipment, and IOT in general, the edge of the network. What's your thoughts on IOT, and how would you, how do you see that evolving? It's just more than just the network, the edge of the network issue, it's bigger. It is, well, I, I mean, of course the devices and sensors are, are important. I think a lot of that's being commoditized. The business that we've been seeing develop, and there's a lot of folks, they've moved from analytics from the web to analytics of IoT. So there's a lot of interesting companies coming in the analytics space. We're not playing in that as much. We tend to like to invest in companies that are big enough that you need to have analytics 
for them. We like companies that have proprietary control of analytics versus necessarily running analytics for company X. So you're not poo-pooing IoT per se, just that from an investment thesis standpoint, it's not That's on right. your radar yet. It's either ca too capital intensive for us as a firm, or you're basically managing someone else's data. I want to be in companies that we're managing our own data for proprietary advantage. That's really what I was going to get to next, the role of data-driven. So we've lived in the Hadoop uh, world. The Cube started in 2010 uh, in the offices of Cloudera, actually, um, and people don't know the history, and it's been interesting. Hadoop was supposed to save the world, uh, the data, but it really started the, the, the data trend, data-driven trend. Mike Olson, Amar Awadal, and the team over there really nailed it, but they, it didn't turn into be just Hadoop, it's everything. So we're seeing that now becoming a bumper sticker, data-driven, marketer, I'm a data-driven executive, I'm a data-driven <laughs> interview. Exactly. What, all this, what does it actually mean? What does data-driven mean to you? Well, data is, there's big data, and then there's actionable data. I mean, obviously, people talk about exhaust, the data coming off, but we really got started with, as you know, we were investors in Waze. Awful lot of data coming out of your cell phone, extracting just the important pieces of it are really what's important. Um, we're investors in a company called Cabbage, which looks at every transaction a small business makes to determine their credit worthiness. It's, it's really, it's the science. People talk about data scientists. What do they actually do? What they're really doing is separating out the wheat from the chaff because it's just a crush of data. I know you, I saw your interview with Andy Jazzy the other day from, from AWS. The amount of data that's being stored is, is um, it's almost unfathomable, mm -hmm. but the, the important people. They have a lot of data. <laughs> they do. You'd like to invest in them now, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that's really, that's really the thing. It's being able yeah. to separate the good data from the bad. Well, if you look at Amazon, I was talking to Jassy, and he didn't really go there because he was kind of on message, but when I talked to Swami, who runs a, the AI group over there, we were talking about, I said to him, I straight up, I'm like, you know, you're running a lot of workloads on your cloud. I'm sure you have data on those workloads. Right. I mean, just the impact of what they could do with that data, this is uh, the, the virtuous cycle that their business model's made up, but it's changing the game for what they can become. That's so right. the thing that we're seeing in the data world is sometimes the outcome might not be what you think, because if you can use the data effectively, it's a competitive advantage, That's not true. A, a department. Right, right. And you have to really stay true to your commitment to data. Uh, what we've seen happen is when companies, if you've been around for 10 years or so, you start to trust your gut. Gut's important, but it can also not lead you to see obvious conclusions because the world changes. Yeah. And also committing to data also means from a practitioner standpoint, investing in the tech, investing in, in, in things to be data driven, not just to say it. Exactly. Okay, so what's the future for you guys? What are you looking at next year? What are some of the things you'd like to accomplish for, from an investment office? I was getting a lot of deals. <laughs> I mean, you did Waze, that was an amazing deal. One of my favorite products. Um, you know, you. How did yeah. that go down? How many people passed on Waze? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how many people passed, but we were lucky. They wanted to, they wanted to bring us into the initial syndicate. They wanted to have some folks who understood. But um, it wasn't that obvious though at the beginning. What was the original pitch? Well, the initial pitch was that they were going to have folks have the Dash devices. Remember the Dash, the, yeah. the product was sitting on your dashboard and they were going to be using it to map Eastern Europe because the Eastern Europe was just coming into the Western world and they didn't really have good roads and good maps. So we thought that's interesting, but they probably also don't have smartphones. So why don't we come across the Atlantic and let's make this thing work in the US. And then from there, the rest took off uh, you know, country by country. We were the number one navigation app yeah. in I think 150 countries at one point. What's the biggest um, uh, thing that you've learned over the past few years in the industry that's different now? I mean, obviously there's some context that I'll, I'll share, which is obviously the big cloud players are, are, are obviously becoming bigger. Scale's a big thing. You got Google, you got Microsoft and Amazon, you got the Facebooks out there as well. Then you get the political climate. I mean, if you go to Washington DC and New York, I mean, you know, Silicon Valley is not really talked highly about these days on the Hill in yeah. Washington. Yet GovCloud is completely changing the game of how the government's going to work with massive innovations and efficiencies, literally overnight. Yeah. So it's almost weird, right? I mean, what's... <laughs> well, you know, it, it is and it isn't. And if you look at it through a longer term horizon, Silicon Valley is again at the forefront. We're really the first ones with more transparency in the industry. All the different movements which are really important and all the conversations that are happening are important and they're happening here first. I think you're starting to see a ripple effect. You're seeing it going through entertainment. You're going to see it in the government. Industry after industry, I think, is going to start to have to be more open as Silicon Valley has, uh, has led the way on that. That's a great point. Take, take a minute to describe for the folks out here, out there watching that aren't from Silicon Valley. What is Silicon Valley in, about, in your opinion? Well, Silicon Valley is, of course, it's, it's more than a mindset, but folks who are here are here on purpose. They come here intentionally. 
there are, I, there are very few people that I know who were born and raised here. So they're coming here because they want to be part of a shared ethos around success, around shared values, and around you know, competition. So it's a really, it's a very healthy environment. I came, I used to live in Washington, D.C., and I couldn't be happier to be 3,000 miles yeah. away. As, if you're a tech entrepreneur, this is the, with this, all the sports and action is, as I always say to use the, the sport, <laughs> I always, we always love sports analogies. Okay, I got to ask you about the, um, the VC situation, obviously around ICOs, initial coin offerings, are being talked about as an alternative to fundraising. There's some security options on token sales as a utility. SEC is starting to put some guideline, guidelines down on what that looks like. But the general sentiment is, it's a new way to raise money. Um, and some people are doing private rounds with mm -hmm. venture capital and doing token sales through ICOs. So you see some hybrids, but for the most part, the hardcore, I don't want to say right or left wing, is there a wing of, 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 <laughs> of political spectrum, but the hardcore ICO guys are like, this is all about the, disrupting the VC community, and you're a VC. Yeah. So uh, you got to take that a little bit personal, but the point is, it's not necessarily, <laughs> what, did you, what did you think about that? I mean, is it, is that, well, I think, I think that's good salesmanship. If you, the VC industry, such as it is, you can fit every VC into one section of Stanford Stadium. There just aren't that many VCs <laughs> to really go after. We're a, <laughs> we're a small group of folks. Um, I think that going after maybe disrupting the way folks are raising money through Kickstarter, things like that, that's all great. Like, we're not going to stop it, we're going to embrace it. I think that there's plenty of different ways to raise capital. I have no compunction about So do you think it's more path. of a democratization trend or a new asset class? So you don't see it in disrupting the VCs per se, but I mean, if there's only a handful of VCs that could fit into Stanford Stadium, for instance, then certainly there's more options. There's, it's a I dilution, think, if I you think will. you look at it as this alternative financing method. Do I take debt? Do I take equity? Do I, do I take venture? Do I take friends and family? It's just one more arrow in the quiver of the entrepreneur. I think you have to be smart about it because thinking that you're going to get the same level of attention from an investor in your ICO that you are going to get from a Series A investor who owns 20% of your company, those are two very different value propositions. So you, got, you see a lot of pitches, and sometimes you have to say no a lot, and that's the way the game is. But a lot of times you want the best deals. Um, but the founder's side of the table, they're looking at the VC, I need money, so they're, that's <laughs> one of the options. But they really want as a value-added partner. So what's, right. your, what's your current take on what that means these days? Sometimes it means a firm, sometimes it means the partner, sometimes it means the community. How are you guys looking at BRV as value-add versus the worst case scenario, which is value subtract? Just, you want, <laughs> you want to have that be, be positive I've seen experience. that written about venture too. <laughs> I know, some right. people experienced it, so. Well, I mean, I think it helps that we've been around now for almost 20 years. We got started in 98, so you have to look at our body of work and the continuum of investments and founders and CEOs and CTOs that we've invested in. There's hundreds and hundreds of people who have taken money from BRV. And so, that's the one of the real positives about this current state we're in is that there's so much transparency. The fact that we are, I like to think we're good actors and have been for a long time, that comes out not through our words, but through the words of the- What would they say about you guys? What would a, uh, your entrepreneurs say about BRV? Well, aside from using buzzwords like value add, they say they know their industry, they're not afraid to ask for help, they're, they call, they try to call problems when they see it, things you like that. You stand by your companies? Absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. Well, what's, not, what's, the, what's your favorite uh, trend that, you, that you're personally interested in? Well, I think, you have to go after healthcare right now. It is just such a big market right now. People have been nibbling all different sides of it right now. There's been folks who are trying to you know, expedite processing. There's actual the innovations happening on the medical side. I think there's just, technology is just now starting to get into that. Technology's gotten into education. How about the startup you guys funded that, that's related to the healthcare oh, sure. field? Right. Yes, we're in a company called Hello Heart which is taking, in, it's really at the confluence of a number of trends. It starts off with, what Hello Heart, Hello Heart is, is it's a personal blood pressure cuff for you as an employee of a big company. More and more companies are starting to self-insure. If you're a big enough company, you know, 10,000 plus employees or even less, even fewer, you're going to want to self-insure to save money. But also, your employees get a very more, much more comfortable with you as an employer. Like, you care about my well-being. So, it's a very virtuous cycle for so the employees. So companies are self-insuring their own employees. Absolutely. But they have to be super big? Is this company... Um, 
Well, this is just one component of a self-insured uh, business. You mm -hmm. also, they, of course, you still have access to doctors yeah. and so forth. I'm not making a pitch for being self-insured yeah. as, as a company. <laughs> <laughs> just saying that. But that's a trend. Uh, it is. It's absolutely a trend, and you're seeing a lot of what I would call point solutions stepping in. To, you know, whether it's psychiatric, whether it's um, you know op opioid help, whether it's um, working at heart conditions. These are all different point solutions which are being amalgamated together to help companies which are self-insuring. So, is Hello Heart for consumers or for business? It's sold to businesses, but individual employees have it, so they okay. can keep track of their blood but pressure. But I can't buy one if I wanted one. Uh, not, not today. Okay. Not today. But I'll make sure I can get one to you. Though. <laughs> I need one. Get all our employees <laughs> instrumented. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Drug tested, all that stuff going on. So uh, people worry about the privacy. I mean, that's something that I would be concerned with. I mean, putting uh, you that's know. That's taken a really fast pendulum swing. Yeah. A few years ago. You know, the Generation X was privacy, you know, there is no privacy. The default was location is always on. That's just flipped 180 degrees in the last few years. Well, Jonathan, thanks for coming into this CUBE conversation. I want to ask you one final question. Uh, one of the things we're passionate about is women in tech and underserved minorities, obviously Silicon Valley has to do a jet better job. It's out on the table um, and it's working, but we're still seeing a lot, of, lot more work to be done. We're seeing uh, title, Titles not being at the right level, but pay's getting there. Some places, but titles aren't. Some pay's still below for women. Still a lot more to work through. What's your, what's your, what are you guys doing for the women in tech uh, trend? How are you guys looking at that? Certainly it's a sensitive topic uh, uh, these days, but more importantly, it's, it's one that's super important to society. It is. Well, I think like a lot of things that have long-term value, it's really about your actions versus your words. And so our firm has uh, two out of the five investment professionals are female. One of the last three CEOs we've founded is a female CEO. We have tech, we have technologists, mm -hmm. we have marketing people, we have CEOs that are females. Yeah. But it's a very much of a of a, 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 a across the board you know, sex, uh, race, and so forth. Yeah. We're, we really try. You guys to are indiscriminate. Good deal is a good deal. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's about making money. Yeah, VCs are in the business of making money. That's people don't understand. You guys have a job to do, but you do a, a good job. Well, yeah, the funny thing is, we're in business of making money, but our investors, for the most part, are not for profits. Large universities. Our biggest investor is the Red Cross. So when we do well, the Red Cross does well, and the country does well. So you're mission driven at this point. Exactly. So it's, is that by design, or is that was that just your selection? Well, we're delighted with our LPs. We have a lot of things. That we, okay. we, it's important that we have synergies in terms of aside from just finances with our well, investors. That's super well. I appreciate. Uh, you coming on, I think it's super great that you're tying society benefits into, into money making and entrepreneurship, great stuff. John Ebner here in theCUBE, BRV, check them out, great VC firm uh, here in Silicon Valley. It's a CUBE conversation, talking about startups and entrepreneurship. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. <laughs>